We've uh, heard many, uh, many interesting talks on many, many issues uh, that will, I'm sure, come up uh, in, in the discussion that follows. Uh, micro de development economics has enjoyed a resurgence in the last 20 years. And uh, one of the most important reasons is the availability of a lot of new data, but also uh, a lot of uh, young, good economists uh, interested in development. And so there's been a resurgence of theoretical, conceptual uh, innovations in the subject, uh, and uh, uh, more especially uh, developments in empirical methodology, which uh, combine theory with data and ask new kinds of questions uh, with a variety of methods, uh, with a lot of uh, econometric sophistication, uh, uh, some even very simple uh, involving randomized uh, control trials. Uh, so uh, we are very fortunate that we have uh, three very distinguished speakers that embody uh, much of this very exciting new work. Uh, the plan uh, is uh, for the first two speakers, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Mark Rosenzweig, to provide their views on what uh, we have learned, what economists have learned about development policies or programs that have worked. And in, in course of doing that, I presume they will be touching on uh, or reflecting on uh, many of the issues that have come up uh, earlier today. Mm -hmm. uh, the macro versus the micro, the uh, 40,000 feet versus the uh, helicopter view, <clears throat> the duration and magnitude of effects, uh, you know, replicability, sustainability, all these terms have been thrown about and uh, uh, let's see if economists have, uh, have a somewhat different perspective on it. And questions of context specificity. Uh, there are policies that may have worked in one place, but to what extent do we know about uh, whether it would work elsewhere? <clears throat> uh, so the plan is for Abhijit and, and Mark Rosenzweig uh, to, to provide a perspective on this and their views on, on these issues. And then the third speaker, Asim Khwaja, will address issues of uh, the implications for future policy, uh, in particular uh, implementation and political constraints. Uh, if it is the case that you know, economists have, are arriving at some kind of consensus about what works, uh, is it always easy to, to get them implemented? <clears throat> so before we start, uh, we just give you a little bit of background on, uh, on each of the speakers. Of course, there's a, there's a biography in, in the handout over there, but let me emphasize in particular, so Abhijit Banerjee, uh, uh, who's at MIT for, uh, for many years now, uh, has worked on uh, almost a whole range of topics that you can think of are important in development, uh, particularly uh, financial markets, land reform, uh, political economy, health, education, aid effectiveness. He's the uh, founder and director of the Poverty Action Lab at MIT, uh, and most recently is working on a book called Poor Economics with Esther Duflo, which is forthcoming next month, I believe. So Abhijit, <coughs> about 15 minutes. Um, thank you, and uh, sorry for giving the organizers a heart attack. I, I really had it written down at 4, but that might be because my calendar doesn't have, has like 3.30 and 4 in it. Uh, I will do better next time. Um, so I, I, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I guess uh, it's hard. It's hard to sort of take on a topic like this because it's in, in, in some ways um, I think any 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 three things that I'm going to say about what, a development that works um, there are whole range of things that that you know Mark and uh, Asim will point out don't work so let me I'm going to cheat and start with uh, sort of general principles uh, rather than specific instances. What have we learned? I think the one, the most, I would say the most important thing we have learned is that, if I had to, is that essentially the conceptual frame that uh, economists have used to think about development issues at one level is both extremely insightful and fundamentally wrong. Um, so insightful in that I think that most things that 
So when I first studied development, most things that people said, at some level, I think there's been back and forth of various kinds. You know, we have sort of decided that some things are more important than others. But if you think the fundamental claims that were being made 20 years ago that were there of the kind, you know, health matters, education matters, um, you know, you shouldn't have too, too much regulation, um, the sh but maybe you should have enough regulation, markets fail all the time and they need both help from outside and regulation. I think at this level of the conversation, all of those claims were, that were being made 20 years ago are true. And the problem is a bit, once you know that, what do you do? Uh, so they're true, but, and I, I think there, I think our in, instinct as economists was to say, well, if education is important, government should invest in education and kind of stop. The problem, I think what we've learned, I think the most important single thing we've learned in the last 20 years is that, that that's the wrong place to stop, which is that, because in some sense, there isn't such a thing as really just to say, education, or there is, may well be one, but you know, it isn't actually a helpful concept from the point of view of anybody who's trying to take any useful decision. When you try to take the decision, the, the granularity of the, of the problem is simply not at the level of concepts like education and health. I mean, it's true that somebody should take education seriously, but that's, that's only the starting point. At that point, I think the thing we've, so we've learned, I think, two sets of things. One is the sort of, to elaborate on the point I was making, which is that, you know, it's, there's not a, it's not very useful to tell people invest in education. I mean, you can say that, but then turns out that that just, that's just op the opening gambit, right? After that, the question is, what education? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Within primary, should we invest in school infrastructure, textbooks, computers, um, teacher training. Within teacher training, should we train them to, to help children who are falling behind or help children who are at, at the top of the class? Uh, within that training, should we give them uh, training every two weeks a year, every year? Should we give them once, uh, train them once and then let let them you know, go out and blossom? Should we train them once in six years for six months? All of those questions, each of those questions in principle can be answered, but each, without answering those questions, saying that you should do uh, invest in education is often, I mean, in principle, it, it's, it, could, it has the risk of being, um, uh, maybe making things worse. Uh, so um, I think one thing, so one of the things we do in, in Poverty Action Lab, uh, where I work, is, is we, we kind of try to aggregate what has been learned from um, randomized trials on education. And even then, we, what we try to do is we try to aggregate the answers to specific questions. Like, uh, suppose you wanted to get primary school children to come to school more often, what are different things you could do? That's still not quite at the level of granularity I was suggesting, because that still aggregates a bunch of things. But you could ask the question, do you, what, what's, what is the best thing you can do? What's the next best thing can you, you can do f based on uh, evidence only from randomized trials? So that, that there's still other evidence that we are deliberately looking away from. So if you take that evidence and you kind of um, for, get rid of all these studies which show interventions which had no effect, and just take the ones which had a positive effect. That leaves you with, you know, 10 or 15 studies uh, which, um, which have positive, um, significant, statistically significant effects on child attendance. Then you go, what you can do is you can calculate how much would each of those interventions cost in getting a child into school for one more year. And, the, and 
when you do that and you graph them, it's the only graph, I, I kind of thought of bringing a presentation. I thought a presentation just takes more time than it's worth, but that one graph I, should, uh, I almost brought. Because it, it's what's striking about it is how different these things are. Now, this is the set of things that were evaluated because some education expert somewhere, or usually many education experts in many places, had suggested that this was the thing to do. Uh, you know, uh, this, the, the, this school meals is the way to get children into school, or, uh, you know, encouraging pay parents to find out what the value of education is the way, way to go, or to have more community participation in schools is the way to go, or just the list of things that were in that list are, is not some, you know, something that some, you know, irresponsible and wacky economists like me came up with. There were, there were serious ideas came from serious people immersed in the world. And if you compare them, you know, the difference in, some of them cost, you know, $100 per child uh, spent an additional year spent in school. Some of them cost five, some of them cost 25. The range of difference among all these pieces of essentially accepted wisdom is an, of an order of 20 to, uh, 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. And I emphasize that as a starting point for two reasons. One is that that says that we can't, that, that we can't just say that, you know, spend money on education or spend money on getting children to school. We need to know which of those levers to press. And second, that these are levers, all of the levers I just talked about, that left out another 20, which had zero effect. So if I take the set of levers that were available and were recommended by experts, that set of levers was all way, uh, you know, there was a huge difference in the productivity of these different levers. So even when you ask, so you cannot, A, you cannot take the ar argument as given from the claim that, you know, you can't just say, go, uh, we should uh, invest in education. That claim is both, I think, suf not sufficiently precise. And we can't throw that to the implementer and say, you go figure it out. So at some level, this is maybe bad news at both, well, from both sides. For, uh, but it's, it certainly makes it very, very clear. And this, this, is, this is a pattern we've got on every single thing we've looked at, is that we, our guesses based on general principles on what would work and what wouldn't work and how, what would work better, the differences, the, we, so it wasn't the case that, you know, some, some things worked a little better than others. Some things worked 20 times better than others. So I'll, I'll give you a couple more examples as I go. But I think the first, I think the probably the single, I think most important thing we've learned is exactly that, which is that not so much that, um, and this might also be true that, as the lip said, context matters, but just getting, understanding what the intervention is and what that particular intervention does matters. And you can't, you can't get the answer right on general principles that, you know, education is good or teacher training is good. It, you'll have to go down several levels below that in, in terms of granularity to get to an answer that's actually usable and reliable. So that, that, that's the first and most important point I want to make. The sec, sec, now, now let me, um, having said that, let me say a few things about other, other um, related, uh, let me say a couple of things which are related, which are, I think the, the two other things I want to emphasize on what we've learned, this is sort of the general, uh, two other general principles. One is, I think that uh, it's very hard to beat giving away money. I think uh, very few interventions do better than that. And um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we did an inter or giving away, uh, this was an intervention of, uh, in, Bangla in West Bengal, of the, the intervention was taking the, taking the poorest of the poor. This was selected by a, a, a PRA in the village uh, where the villagers choose who the poorest are. Then they were verified through a complicated process. And then those people were given an asset. Each of them was given an asset and some 
training in how to use the asset, let's say, which is, asset turns out to usually a goat or a pig, so, you know, its training was appropriate to that. Uh, and then, and these were people who were literally mostly abandoned women, or women with husbands who were either alcoholics, very sick, mentally uh, ill, uh, all, they got this, uh, if you look at the effect of this program, um, you, a, a year and a half later, you see these people, the program sort of, there was a period of support which went at, at the beginning for six months. This is 12 months after that. You see that these people are making roughly, uh, a, they, if you think of the return on that money, they're getting 80% more consumption 80% of that money. So if you, get, if you think $100, they're getting about $80 more consumption per family uh, per, uh, per year. So they're getting roughly, I think, 80% uh, back. And that's per year. So one investment of, of $100 is giving you 80% more money. Uh, it's hard to think of a development in, intervention that does much better than that. For example, we've done a few RCTs on uh, on microcredit, and it doesn't have anything like this kind of return. So that's that's sort of one one I think. Uh, the second and last thing I want to say is uh, is I think we sh we shouldn't believe that we we can rely on pe people's uh, sort of s self uh, interest to, to de uh, deliver to them um, sort of what I would call uh, pro, pro uh, sort of a or you could traditionally economists call merit goods. So health, uh, I think that all the, and by now we have a, maybe 15 or so RCTs on different kinds of health goods and the demand for those goods. And what is very, very clear is that despite whatever uh, we as economists believe about self-interest and wh whatever, um, I think everybody has the incentive to try to say, well, we should price these goods. Whenever you price these uh, things like, you know, water purification or bed nets for malaria or um, uh, pills for um, intestinal worms at the market price, nobody wants them. And uh, I think, that, uh, and that's a pattern we've seen across many, many goods now. Um, you, you stoves which which ha don't create indoor air pollution. Here's a whole list of these products, each of which is supposed to be kind of pro-social, merit goods, and you don't see you just don't see the private demand for it. So I think if we want to, uh, if we wanted to actually have people have better health, I think. Uh, I think right now my sense is that the best thing we can do is is sub subsidize them massively. There's no particular argument against it. They're, these are mostly poor people who need them. There are reasonable ways to make transfers, and uh, there would be uh, so. Other than I think, other than giving away money, I think we should give away money, uh, especially as a way to as subsidies to merit goods. So I'll I'll stop there. Okay, our next speaker is Mark Rosenzweig, uh, who's, <coughs> uh, as he goes up to the podium, uh, let me just tell you some of the areas that he's worked in. Uh, he's worked uh, particularly on immigration and refugee policy in the United States, and uh, written research papers on a very wide variety of topics in development, labor markets, immigration, education, health, fertility, savings credit and insurance, technological adoption and diffusion, agricultural development, and the environment. Thank you, Dilip. Let me start by waking you up by saying I, I sat through the whole conference and I didn't hear a single example of anything that worked with respect to development. Okay. So I'm now going to present three examples of war, where uh, there was at least some success. And let me define the criteria I use for picking these examples. One is that these were big and broad changes in development policy at the aggregate level. 
Two, that their impact occurred over at least a 20-year period that was perceptible. And three, that there is a lot of microdata surrounding these interventions so that we have some insights into the connections between the policies and the outcomes. Now, what I want to emphasize is, as you see in the title there, that these were agendas that partially worked. And you'll see what I mean. Now, the criteria that we're going to look at for works, which is an issue in itself that we didn't discuss very much, is one, and only one, sustained income growth. You know, did these changes in these agendas affect uh, growth and in income, okay? including, in particular, the poor? Now, when we look at low-income countries, it's pretty clear who the poor is. You don't need poverty indices. Okay? The poor are in rural areas who are landless. And the poorest of the poor are probably women. And so one thing we can look at besides average income growth is what happens to the poorest of the poor, what happens to women. Okay? A second criteria we might use for a success would be that there were sustained improvements in human capital, broadly defined, education and health, nutrition, again, for these different groups. And then third, we might want to look at whether these interventions, these policies were transformative, that they structurally changed the economy. Now, my notion of development is that countries like Africa or India, countries in Africa, of course, and India, Bangladesh, the ones we've discussed, Kenya, okay, end up looking something like Europe or California, where there's a small portion of the population working in agriculture, which is an awful occupation. I mean, one measure of welfare, of how well a population is doing, is that there are a lot of people no longer working out in the field in the mud. Okay? If you look at the picture on the program, um, the, the red page with all those pictures, you'll see examples of women in saris or something or out in the, in the rice fields. I'll have a picture of myself. So what are the three I'm going to look at? They're up there. So one is a major combination of NGO and public investments in public health in Bangladesh, as well as investments in schools and other kinds of programs providing encouragement in school, okay, which resulted in a substantial decline in morbidity. They were successful in the target that they had, which is to improve health, eliminate diarrheal disease through educational means, through infrastructure development improvements, and cleaning up of the water. And I'll talk about what happened as a consequence of this. It is a success story of Bangladesh, for sure. The second, we've already had an experiment in which we've had agricultural investment, the Green Revolution. And we have lots of data from India, and we're going to look at that and see what was the success and in what dimensions. And then the third thing that I'll look at in a particular context is another policy change, again in India, which is the trade policy reform, opening up the economy. What did it do? So we have three, three agendas, and these agendas correspond to what a lot of economists who usually tack on to one singular thing. So Jeff Sachs will always talk about how we need to improve public health. Well, the, the, the intervention in Bangladesh is mostly that. Other people talk about, and the Gates Foundation is very strong on this, investment in agricultural technology. Well, let's see what happened, because we did that. And other people talk about trade openness, like Ann Krieger. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to look at these uh, criteria as partial success stories. Okay. So we'll start with Bangladesh. I've already described what has gone on, the tremendous reductions in morbidity. And we have uh, the first not pretty graph. Okay, it's going to show you some of the things that went on in Bangladesh from 1980 to 2002, okay? over, again, over the 20-year period. Actually, let, let me pause for a second and talk about, just to, to fix ideas, about one intervention that, that actually meets two of my criteria, but not the third. You've all heard about the Progressive Program. The Progressive Program was a conditional cash transfer program initiated in Mexico under the Zadillo presidential regime. That was a program that provided cash benefits to families conditional on sending children to school. That program has been copied all over Latin America and other parts of the world, and has spread all over uh, Mexico from its initial set of villages that they began in. Right? So it corresponds to the criteria. It was a big program. They had the foresight 
to collect data at the baseline and follow up, to randomize the initiation of that program so that it corresponds to the second criteria, we know exactly what the impact was. The reason I'm not going to talk about it, although I guess I am talking about it, <laughs> is that it failed the third criteria. It had nothing to do with development. It increased schooling by 0.6 years and nothing else. And I have a good authority who agrees with me on that. And that authority is my colleague, Ernesto Zedillo, who when asked and was congratulated by someone, it was actually the president of Dartmouth, on this wonderful program that he initiated, he said, it actually was a complete failure. Because he thought that was a development program, and it was not. Merely pushing up schooling, whatever it's one year or 0.6 years or 0.1 year, is not the same as, as development. Okay, so let's now return to Bangladesh, where you'll see that there were uh, more changes than, than that. The continuous line there, so here is something people have not realized. Bangladesh, Muslim country, okay? The continuous line there is the ratio of secondary school enrollment rate for girls over boys. And you see in the late 1990s that it crossed the threshold of one. That in Bangladesh today, there are more girls enrolled in secondary schools than boys. Right? That's a tremendous accomplishment uh, for, that, for that country. Okay? The line below the continuous line that's discontinuous that also is trending up is the proportion of the rural population that has clean water. So you see over the same period where you have the start of the trend of, of enrollment, water was being cleaned up. And I'll talk about the other lines in a second because they, they'll, they'll be about the partial. Okay? If we look, we have survey data that covers this period. And if we look at the bottom there, those are the school enrollment rates by age of boys and girls. The boys are continuous line, the girls are discontinuous line. And you can see that in 1981-82, two, two things. One is school enrollment rate was much higher 20 years later. And secondly, that there's a reversal. Now the girls are, have higher enrollment rates than boys at, at every age. Okay? So that's a tremendous accomplishment. Also, improvements in body mass indices over the 20 year period. Improvements in health, unambiguous, that you see in something that, that's real and productive that we show in the economy for boys and girls, for men and women. Improvements in height, stature increased over this 20 year period. Right? These are tremendous accomplishments in a poor country. Okay? And we know that public health played a major role because when we look at actual changes in calorie intake, which is shown in this graph by males and females, you see that in 1981, if anything, calorie intakes were actually higher in 81 than they were in 2002, 20 years later. The only way then BMI could have increased or height could have increased is to increase the efficacy of calorie intakes, i.e. by reducing morbidity. And the reason, so this did not occur because of income growth. It did not occur because people could eat more or eat more calories. It was this public health intervention. All right, so that's the success story. And we have good data that ties the nutritional impacts on schooling and why it differentially uh, affects boys and girls that I won't go, go into. Okay, but here's the bad news. I'll go back to the graph. The top line the top discontinuous line that has no trend is wages in the rural areas of Bangladesh. That is to say, agricultural productivity, which is pretty well tracked by these wages, did not increase at all during this 20-year period. This massive intervention in public health, which unambiguously increased schooling and increased uh, health, had no transformative effect on agriculture or the rural population whatsoever. If you look at the occupational distribution in, to, in 1980, and you look at it in 2005, you find that people are doing the same thing. There's still 16% of men pulling rickshaws. Two-thirds of people are in menial jobs using f physical activities. Very few women are in the, are in the, the labor force. Okay? So this was a partial success. It did improve human capital indicators, but it had very little effect on the economy and certainly nothing transformative. Basically, life in Bangladesh in rural areas looks pretty similar today as it did before this intervention, but people, and this is not to be belittled, are much healthier and better educated, and there's more equality between um, men and women, but not in occupational equality. Okay? So that's an interesting story. The next one is the Indian Green Revolution. Five minutes, I'll never make it. Um, people are familiar with the Green Revolution. It was a policy change. Late 1960s, invention of new high-yielding varieties, not in India. We're going to talk about India, but they didn't, weren't invented in India. They were invented by international organizations 
working in Mexico, working in the Philippines. The policy was that the Indian government let them in. You know, that, that seems trivial. It seemed trivial then, but right now, right, we have policies that say you can't bring in uh, ge genetically modified organisms, which is what these were. And the Indian government embraced them. So there was a real change in policy. And of course, the Green Revolution is not just bringing in those initial seeds, but a continuous improvement in seed technology. And okay, the success is clear. And we have good data that ties the two things. If we wanted to know what has happened to the lives of people in rural areas, in particular the poorest of the poor, look at agricultural wage rates because that's what the poorest of the poor earn. And this graph shows you beginning of the time of the Green Revolution up till the 2000s, say, there's sustained increase in real wages, okay, as well as yields in agriculture. And if you look at the whole time series of wages in real wages from other sources, that's what happens to real wages. Okay? No question there was economic growth in the rural area. Okay? There's also improvements in nutrition, in height. Okay? There is uh, girls and boys. And there were increases in schooling, slightly faster rise for girls than boys, not as fast as in, as in Bangladesh. Right? That's associated not with any particular strong or big health interventions or strong and big schooling interventions, but there surely had to be more schools for more schooling but rather as a product mostly of the fact that technical change, we have good evidence, raised the returns to schooling because it meant that farmers had to be more on the technological frontier. That required being more sophisticated about agriculture, handling uh, new, new ideas. So that's all great, agricultural development. But unlike the standard models that were in place 30 years ago of what would happen if you developed agriculture, which is, what that, which is that that would actually lead to industrialization, you did not find that. Okay? Those basic ideas were, were closed economy models where improvements in agricultural productivity would drive down the price of food, which would necessitate the exit of people out of agriculture who would go into industry at lower wages, and you would have this balanced growth. Well, that's precisely what you don't see in India. Okay? If we look at rates of urbanization across major countries of, of the world, China, Indonesia, and Nigeria, and compare them to India between 75 and 2000, you see that urbanization in India lags behind all these other countries by a lot. There was not a massive outgrowth, outflow of people from, from rural areas. India is not developing. We can look at other indicators as well, but one consequence of that with population growth and very slow exit from the population is that the average farm size in India is minuscule. If we think of modern agriculture as being large scale and mechanized, that's not India. If we think that to be really productive and internationally competitive in agriculture is to be large scale and mechanized, without any change in the management of farms, 80, 76, sorry, 87 percent of farms in the United States today are family farms. Okay? Their average farm size is 200 hectare, hectares. In India, the average farm size is 1.55 hectares, right? More than two orders of magnitude lower than in the United States. 76% of farms in India are less than two hectares. Now, why is that important? I don't know if you can see those pictures. The upper left picture is a picture of what goes on in rice farming in Bangladesh and India. And the lower right picture is what goes on in farms in California. Same seed, rice. Okay? The bottom right is multiple times more productive and efficient than the upper left. Okay? So the small farm size, the lack of exit from agriculture uh, was, and here you see the fraction of farms in India that are, that are mechanized okay, by farm size. Okay? They're hardly mechanized. Why? They're too small. You could not use this implement in the lower right-hand corner on most of the farms in, in India, even though that would make them presumably far more productive. Okay? So there was an increase in wages, increase in health, increase in schooling, but not a transformation of the Indian economy. There was something missing in, in the industrial uh, sector. And if we look at the social organization in India, one indicator we have, what happened, for example, to the caste system, traditional marriage and everything else. If we look at the rates of out marriage, what fraction of people were marrying outside of their subcaste over this period of the Green Revolution where incomes were rising and education was rising, we see, as you see in the graph, that very few people were moving out of their, of their, of their subcaste. Okay, the last one I'll do in the zero minutes remaining 
okay, trade policy change uh, in, in India, okay? Now, one of the th manifestations of that from opening up the economy is there's clearly going to be more trade and there's going to be more commerce. And one of the cities that immediately could benefit from that would be Mumbai, which had traditionally been a city where trade and commerce was going. But before this, there was also another sector in that city, which was uh, mills, okay? Mills were sort of dying in the late by, the, by the late 1980s. So this was a good time for the transformation of the Mumbai economy from one of mills to trade and, and commerce. One of the things that you could surmise might happen when you open the economy to the world is that the returns to knowing English are going to go up. You know about call centers and financial centers and other things where India is taking advantage of their comparative advantage in English. Okay, so you might suspect that one of the outcomes of this is a high return to English. And one of the major choices, at least in Mumbai, that people make is whether to send their kids to an English medium school where they learn English, learn in English, and they learn English, or to send them to a local language school. Okay? Well, we have data over the 20-year period before and after the trade reform for Mumbai, and this is what happened to the return to going to an English medium school. This graph shows you that by 2000, those who went to an English medium school were earning uh, 22 23% more than those who did not, while in 1980, the premium was only 15%. During that same time period, the returns to an additional year of schooling, net of whether it's English or not, stayed exactly the same. The big news was returns to English went up. For women, it's more dramatic, pre and post the uh, change in the policy. A big rise in the returns to going to an English medium school. Now, we might expect then that people would demand English medium schooling. But English medium schools were expensive and private, and local language schools were governmental and free. And if you look at enrollment rates in the two schools, not surprisingly you find that upper caste people were dominating the English medium schools and the lower caste, the rest of the population, 85% of the rest of the population, were in the, the schools that were in the local language. Okay? Well, what happened? This is what happened when we look at the girls. The bars there give you the enrollment rates in English medium schools. 1982-84 is before the reform, okay? And you see that uh, the light bars are the fraction of the Brahmin uh, families, uh, girls that were going to those schools, and the dark bar is the fraction of the lower caste, which again is most of the population, okay? And you see by uh, the end of the period that we were looking at, uh, 15 or 10 to 15 years after the reform, right, the lower caste girls had moved strongly into the expensive, and uh, English medium schools, okay, almost catching up to the, the Brahmins in terms of their representation. You see the same thing for boys at a lower rate, okay, massive shifts into English medium schools that are expensive. People are willing to pay more, even the poorest of the, of the families, for these, uh, for these schools. But you're also changing the social mix of the elite schools, okay? And the consequence of this and the consequence of the change in the occupational structure was essentially removing one of the benefits of what the caste was doing, which was basically helping people get jobs in the blue-collar sector, which was mostly for males. Okay? And the end result is that when you look at labor force participation, for example, across three generations, you look in the old generation, the grandmothers in our, in our survey, right? hardly any women were working. You looked at the current adults in uh, the, the last decade of the 20, 20th century, Women weren't working very much, but the ones that were working were the upper caste women. Okay? But when you get to the next generation, after the reforms, you see it's a different picture. Almost now, the majority of all women are working across caste in the markets. Transformative, socially transformative. Okay? And if you look finally at outmarriage rates, you see that in contrast to the rural sector, this is the same country. In contrast to the rural sector, where there's been this transformation of the economy due to the structural change in occupations from the trade openness, you see now that there's a lot more people not adhering to the caste, uh, the caste boundaries in terms of, of marriage. So what do we take away from this? We take away, I think, that there are success stories, that policy does matter, you can really change an economy, but this notion that there are singulate cures to lack of development is what's wrong. The reason that these are all only partial successes 
is that there is no way you can develop an economy with one type of intervention. You can't de fully develop an economy with just improving agriculture. You can't fully develop an economy by just improving health. And maybe you can come close to doing it with a trade policy, but obviously something is wrong because all the benefits and changes that you saw in, the, in this Mumbai part of the Indian economy were not transferred to the rest of the economy, not to the rural sector at all. Obviously, there were some other barriers that were in the economy that needs examination. So there are things that work, but since the East Asian tigers had their great success, in fact, there is no development policy that has fully worked because none of the countries that we're talking about are, in fact, fully developed, right? And that's because there has not been a comprehensive set of development policies that work. Okay. Thank you. Asim Khwaja, whose uh, research is uh, focused on uh, three main areas of development economics. First is finance, uh, credit constraints, corruption in lending, and stock market manipulation. Second, he's worked uh, extensively on schooling in Pakistan, especially uh, the emergence of, of private schooling in Pakistan and how it's going. And, uh, and finally, he's worked on community and local government uh, and uh, also uh, in the topic of religion and tolerance. Uh, Thanks, Dilip. Um, this is loud enough. Um, so, so Dilip was very kind in, in, in saying what I would do in this session, uh, which was kind of... Um, not as much give a perspective of what, what development has worked, but sort of where we're, where we're headed. And I, I think the, uh, the reason he was nice is, I, the reason he was doing that, the real reason is that I felt very uncomfortable um, kind of uh, giving a sense of what I think the big achievements have been in development. Uh, um, Abhijit was my advisor in grad school, and uh, Mark is someone I learned tremendously as a junior faculty member, so I just don't think I have the body of knowledge to be able to to do that. Um, so um, what I thought I'd do instead, therefore, is, is give a sense of, um, as someone who um, is kind of really at the stage where I, I'm thinking of what next and what are the sort of work and development, uh, start thinking about what are the exciting future areas. And, and a lot of it is going to come from, to be honest, uh, frustrations with my own work um, and sort of and then pushing from that, that sort of healthy platform, if you will. Um, and, and I think one of the things, so, so I'm going to give you a couple of anecdotes about what I mean by frustrations from my own work. Um, to contrast in, in some of the things we've said before, there is a sense that, you know, we're trying to understand sort of when development happens, um, what that means for development to happen, or perhaps even why it happens, what are the underlying mechanisms which sort of produce some of the changes that that Abhijit and Mark alluded to. Um, I'm sort of increasingly more fascinating by what made it happen to begin with, um, sort of that, that first stage. Uh, so for instance, when Mark talks about opening up uh, as trade liberalization, what is that impetus that allowed that policy action to be taken? Um, and I'm increasingly obsessed, I would say, with, with, that, with that concern. And, and let me tell you why it's, it's stemming from frustration in my own work, and I'll give you some examples about it. And I've, I find that a very exciting area in development, um, at least in economics um, of development. Um, so, so there are two sort of experiences, and these are from work that I've done. Um, so one is uh, working in financial market reform. So I, I have some work which looks at manipulation in financial markets of various forms. And there's a whole range of this. I'm sure people are familiar with various forms of manipulation. Um, actually, it used to be that one would refer to these stories in developing countries, and now it's clear that uh, manipulation in financial markets is, is healthy and present in developed markets as well. Um, uh, in fact, that's a very nice illustration of, I think, the naivety that at least I had in my work, um, which was, you know, at some level, the reform was obvious, right? So let's take a very specific example. So some work I have looks at manipulation in stock markets in Pakistan. And I'll give you a very simple way of manipulation, how it occurs. So Adil and I are two brokers. Um, we basically trade back and forth. I can see this in the data. I sell 50,000 shares today as a broker. Adil buys them. The next day, he sells them back to me. Literally, I, I exactly observe this. Over time, obviously, the price rises. Uh, at some stage, you know, we have 
you know, someone walking in. Maybe Dilip comes in and is excited about this. He's, he's excited about investing in the equity markets. And he buys. And the minute that happens, Adil and I smile at each other and leave. And the market collapses. Uh, and Dilip loses most of what he had. Uh, and then when the market has collapsed, Adil and I start this again, and a new Dilip emerges. So you actually see this in the data. You can estimate how much return brokers are making. They're making on the order of about a million to $2 million. This is in Pakistan. The market cap is about $50 million, so a substantial amount of money they're making. Now, a consequence of what they're doing is the market is really small. People know this is essentially a gambling den. This is not a way you raise equity. It's a speculation area. It's, it's uh, in an Islamic country where you don't have a Las Vegas. It's the equivalent of that. Okay. So what do you do? So the reforms are actually pretty easy. Uh, so I, I remember talking to the regulators. This was pretty straightforward to see in the data. They're pretty straight. This, by the way, used to be called in the 1900s in the NYSC, the New York Stock Exchange. This was called painting the tape or pump and dump. It's been documented. The obvious reform which worked was an independence uh, of the Board of Governors. So the, the, the exchange basically went from a broker-controlled exchange to having sufficient outside presence, and hence uh, easy ways to regulate and monitor these sort of schemes. So this sort of silly way of making money, this extremely obvious pump and dump scheme, at least you could see in the data and prevent. I remember talking to the regulator and saying, why don't we do this? This is great. It's obvious, you know, easy ways of checking at me. And that's when the increasingly the, my naivety about how the world works sort of started hitting me more and more in the face. Um, I'll give you an anecdote about why that. So I've, I've, over the course of this project, I talked to at least three or four of these, uh, the regulators of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The last one actually in my office in the Kennedy School. And he looked at me and smiled and said, you know, I'm doing this reform, but do you know I'll be fired in a month? I said, OK, well, how do you know that? And he, he said, I won't name who the, gov who the government was then, uh, but he said I was going to the then president's office with my list of reforms. And I was, as I was walking in, one of the biggest brokers was walking out from that office. And he smiled at me and said, I know exactly what you're going to say, and it's not going to happen. And actually, three weeks later, he was fired after saying that to me. So, so that's one anecdote. So the reform is pretty obvious. I kind of know exactly how to stop this. We know there's an easy, quick fix on this, uh, yet it's never going to happen. Right? And, and the, the, exchange, uh, uh, the, the, the stock exchange is still troubled with that. The second example is, is education. Um, so I should have actually given that graph. Uh, like Abhijit, I had, if there's one graph I wanted to show, it's going to be that one. Um, if you plot teacher wages against some measure of performance, this is, again, from Pakistan data in the public and the private sector. So the performance could be the test scores of the kids in your school, or it could be actually your own test score as a teacher. In the private sector, in this environment, you see an upward sloping curve. Makes sense. Higher performing teachers are paid more. In the public sector, I thought you'd see kind of a flat curve. You know, okay, performance, we, you know, we have flat incentives. There's reasons to have flat incentives. You actually see a downward sloping curve. Right? Uh, you see that uh, better teachers, or teachers that produce better results for their kids are paid less. That seems extremely perverse. Um, the reason it's not so perverse is the method of payment is a very different method. You pay on seniority. So experienced teachers get paid more. Then the, then the next question that, that that begs is, well, why is it the case that experienced teachers are perform underperforming? Well, they're underperforming because they can get away with underperforming. Senior means you're more powerful. You're usually the, the head teacher in a school. No one's going to force you to show up. So it's teacher absenteeism. It's low teacher incentives. Now, again, you can imagine ways, and, and Abhijit had mentioned some of the work that j has done on that. You can imagine ways to, to try and address that, ways to kind of monitor teachers better, get, get a better uh, sort of effort from teachers. But ultimately, the, the thing which kept on worrying me was, in the case of the regulator, the regulator knew what to do. In the case of education, the Secretary of Education, actually the several Secretaries of Education that we encountered in the five-year life of the period, there were about four different Secretaries, um, all of them kind of knew this. Right? So what is it that is preventing them from then taking that next step, whether it be effective ways of monitoring or some other means? So, so what, we, what I've started getting really excited about in development, and I feel like it's a, it's a promising area of work, and this is no surprise, I'm at the Kennedy School, it is a school of government, so it's not surprising I'm saying this, is trying to understand the policy actor better. 
if you will, trying to understand the actor who ultimately makes these policies. Now, when I say policy actor, I'm, I'm on purpose being a bit vague about what that is, who that policy actor is. Depending on the environment you're thinking of, it could be a politician, it could be a bureaucrat, and in some societies, actually, uh, civic actors have become majorly policy actors. In fact, in countries like Pakistan, the media is acting as a policy actor. Right? Um, but to be honest, we don't have, at least within economics, a very clear sense of this, of this creature, of this policy actor. We don't have a clear sense of what their preferences are. We don't clear, have a very clear sense of what their incentives are. We also don't have a very clear sense of how they react to the information we are producing. So my biggest fear is if I walk up to various ministers of education and I say, here's the returns to doing something in education, or here's the returns of doing something in health, my biggest fear is they'll say, is that it? That's all? Right. So one view I've had for a long time is that we can constrain these policy actors by producing a body of knowledge which says, you can't do this because this is bad, or you have to do this because this is incredibly good. That presupposes that their own views of those things were pessimistic than my estimate. And I'm worried that that might not be the case. Right. And if that isn't the case, then I'm worried that the reason this is not being done is not because this actor wasn't convinced that this is valuable, is that there's some other rents to be had, which are extremely valuable. The reason I'm not giving high performance, and in fact, the first thing I said in this project in education we did to the then Secretary of Education was, what could we do pay for performance? And he smiled at me and said, there's no way you can go there. Just forget that. Just completely take that off the table. And this is a very genuine guy. This is the guy who really wants to do it. That was his first statement to me, which is this is off the table. So how does one, so it's fine to say these things, how does one make any substantive progress in this? Okay. We all know these actors are important. Um, you know, so, so let, me, let me give some sense of that. Again, these are, these are sort of ideas I've been working in for the last, um, to be honest, only several months or at most a year and a half or so. so it's still kind of something I'm thinking a lot more about. Um, so, so one thing is sort of this calibration exercise. We go ahead and try to figure out who these relevant actors are and calibrate in various ways how they respond to, what their career concerns are, how they respond to information, what their own internal preferences are. And there are ways we can start measuring these. They're, they're modern tools both in economics but lots of other fields like psychology or sociology which allow us to do this better. Um, the other thing I think increasingly I'm beginning to think is... Um, is an odd separation that I've faced and, and, and would like to get rid of, is a separation between research and policy or implementation. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. So, so often the way I've viewed my work is, even work which is really meant to kind of inform policy, is we're going to do a pilot. Okay? I'm going to pick a few schools. I'm going to pick a few areas, and I'm going to do something there. And often that something that I'm doing is usually not even with the actor who's eventually going to do it. It has to be in an environment where I can control. So often it's a partner who's another local research organization or something, kind of independent of the state or the normal actors. I'm going to do it. It's going to give me my pilot. And then I'm going to take this pilot's results and I'm going to convince the actual implementer to scale up. Right? So, so the, the policy evaluation, the pilot evaluation, and the scale up. Um, my, my recent frustration is that you know, that's not the way one would like to do things. Really, this research and policy is simultaneous. There's a synergy between the two which forces it really to happen in sync. So let me give you a different model. Um, and I, I'll, I'll make it concrete by explaining some, some, at least one project where I'm trying to do this, uh, and some others I think are trying to do this. Um, you sit with the policy actor, and as policy is being designed, you're designing ways within that of evaluating. There's no, like, well, there's no pilot, there's no, it's a continuous process. So I'm learning constantly, I'm evaluating constantly, and I'm doing constantly as well. And as I'm learning, I'm, I'm figuring out the mistakes I'm making in what I did. I had some initial idea of the best way of soliciting taxes, the best way of getting education was. And then I have an outcome which I can observe, which tells me I missed. And I immediately redesign, right? This is sort of how engineers, by the way, I'm not necessarily pushing an engineering view of the world, but this is how engineers calibrate machines, right? There's a constant research slash doing aspect to it. Um, so that's the second sort of, um, um, with the salience of the policy actor, the second thing is, is the simultaneity of 
of research and, 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 and actual policy making or actual implementation. And hence this differentiation between the pilot stage and the scale up stage becomes kind of redundant. There isn't. You're constantly in a pilot stage, you're constantly in a scale up stage. Um, now, can you actually do these things? So, so I thought there are, two, there are two examples going back to the two things I talked a bit about. Actually, one of them is going to be on taxation. So one is education. So I'll be very brief on that because that's something I'm, I, I'm less familiar with, but it's drawing on actually some of the work Abhijit and another colleague of mine are doing. So one of the questions that I've been frustrated with in the Pakistani context is how do you make education or learning in education a politically salient object? Why is it that in the Pakistani context the politician gets far more rents by posting teachers from one village to the other, which is what they're mostly doing. A massively valuable thing. Far less loss of rents, political or otherwise, by having a really bad teacher destroy education in an entire village. You'd think that the trade-off should be the other way around. You think that this little job you've created for this guy which pays 4,000 rupees is far less valuable than the fact that you've destroyed human capital acquisition for X number of years for an entire generation of, of these villagers. But it's not. It's clearly by the decision that the politician is doing or the bureaucrat is doing, they're saying it's not as important. Okay. So what do I need to know about this politician's incentives which tells me that they're not sensitive to learning, to average learning outcomes in their population? And I think the work which is promising, which I've seen people do, and this is Abhijit and, and Rohini Pandey are, are doing this work in a slightly different context, which is trying to see what politicians respond to. Right? So as you give information about quality, what are voters responding to? So imagine giving information campaigns about the quality of your elected official. Do they care about the corruption of this official? Do they care about their service delivery record? Um, and simultaneously, what are political actors responding to as they have, they have these information campaigns, right? So you're understanding the detailed preferences of both of these actors. Now, it could be that from that you reveal that they just don't care or somehow it's really hard for them to demonstratively show the loss of bad learning, where it's much easier to show the salience of a job being allocated or not being allocated. I don't know. I'm just conjecturing. Let me end with just another example of a, of a similar project. So this is a project that I've been trying to work on in Pakistan, which is tax reform. This is a country which is in financial distress. A big issue is how to raise revenue. A big political issue is how to raise revenue without you losing mass support. It's always been very hard. One simple example, I'm working on property tax. Property tax, every five years, you're supposed to update your valuation tables. It's a simple thing. Properties are changing prices. You should basically increase the valuation of, 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 of your assessed taxes. For the last five years, we've been unable to do that. Right. With a very powerful government, by the way, this time, at least at the provincial level, who has a mandate, because there's a perceived massive cost, political cost of doing so. And there's a very little perception of any returns immediately from doing so. So this project basically has been for the last year and a half, we've kind of embedded ourselves as researchers in the tax department and are working in sync with developing reforms where you're trying to figure out, you're trying to get everyone on board. And it's a very interesting process, something I've never been used to. Uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, people like Adel and others, I'm sure in this room are much more familiar with this world than, than I was. But you know, making sure the rankers, the actual guys in this tax office, the guys who are in the field, have a mechanism which they're happy with. Making sure the senior officials in the department who have their own kind of funny optimizations and funny objectives are OK with this. Making sure the finance department is wish willing to dish out money to do this. Making sure the political actors are on board with this. And finally, making sure the average person who is going to respond to increased taxation is going to do it in a way which has the least political cost to you. Right? So that's just one example of what I was saying. Now, in some sense, pulling back on what I said earlier, this is where I feel the kind of when the reform happens, you know, what is it that made the reform happen or adopted the reform to happen? This actor is, to me, fascinating now. Uh, and I feel like, at least in economics, in developing economics, economics, this is an actor we haven't really understood or studied as much. We've hoped that this actor is benign, uh, but clearly there are serious agencies with this actor. And that's what I'm hoping to see a lot more work on. Um, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so following those three presentations, I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions, but time is limited and uh, the hour is late. 
So let's, uh, let's keep the questions brief. I'll take three questions at a time and then have uh, the panel answered. So starting with... Hi, my name is Prisca Castaner, and my question is for Dr. Ro Rosenweith. <laughs> um, It's on. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Prisca Castaner, and my question is for Dr. Mark Rosenberg. Um, you were uh, talking about a program of schooling in, in Mumbai, Mumbai, and um, uh, where you were saying that the lower caste are attending uh, schools in English um, in a higher proportion than, lower, uh, than higher uh, caste. Is that right? No that lower caste are attending uh, English uh, schools? No? No. I'm sorry, then I got you wrong. Yeah. I'm but so I'll, sorry. I'll, but I'll okay, okay, I'm so sorry. Okay. So the answer was that what happened was that the rate of increase for the lower caste was higher than for the, the upper caste among the girls. But it was still true that the upper caste had higher rates. Okay, first, I thank for the wonderful panel and a very impressive, impressive discussion. My question is there, but it needs a little bit of reference. More than 100 years ago, Dada Bhai Naoroji is the first person who raised the issue that there is a discrimination in, in economic growth in India between British, I mean, England and, and India and sovereignty matters because of, because of Paradhinata and all these things. So the, there is not only underdevelopment, but within the underdevelopment, there is a, there is a discrimination. And then India got sovereignty and the Neuruvian socialism but both economic growth didn't increase so much, and discrimination remains. And then, the 1991, the reform took place, and, and India experienced a tremendous growth next to China, and everything is, is, is fine, and there is a wonderful example of development. But still, there is, a, there is a discontent. Let me give three examples. A, the current issue of Harvard International Review, the special issue on India's under development and inequality and development. And yesterday's Wall Street Journal, there is an article in page one and page 16 that instead of economic growth, India suffers from discrimination and all these things. And the chair of the panel, uh, Professor Dilip Mukherjee with Professor Purna Bardhan, has an, has an I mean, fascinating article in Economic Review, this issue that even in socialist government in West Bengal, that because of land reform, it didn't make much difference either in terms of economic growth or, or, or in terms of employment. So the issue is that, that when it was uh, not independent, there is a discrimination. When there is a independence, still there is a discrimination. When there is a neoclassical economics, still there is a discrimination. And even in Marxist economy in West Bengal, still there is a discrimination. So what is your policy prescription? Okay, one more question on the back, on the right side there. Uh, I had a question for Dr. Banerjee. Um, I think it would come as no surprise that unconditional transfers of money and use of subsidies would have the greatest effect on helping the poor in the short term. I was just wondering how you would reconcile that with, I would say, the majority of the other speakers today who have placed a lot more importance on um, efforts that empower the poor to help themselves. And while those efforts like microfinance or um, strategies like that might not show as much of a short-term impact, that in the long run they're a lot more effective. Okay, so over here, do you want to respond? <coughs> yeah, I'll respond to that. Um, I think the evidence uh, on microfinance, to the extent that I know it, is uh, mostly uh, comes from comparing people who who voluntarily join microfinance with others and. Uh, I don't trust that evidence. Uh, I think the only reliable evidence in microfinance in, in things where j participation is so much of, of your life choice is, is to do uh, 
uh, randomized control trials and where the, the gains you see, you don't, it's not that you don't see gains, you just see very small gains. And that's very, very consistent across a range of, um, I, th I, I think you, you, you see, I think there are at least three studies in different countries, one in Morocco, one in South Africa, one in India, which find very, very similar results, small gains. And it's not, no surprise. I think in a sense, we, we have this, fanta so this right fantasy about the poor that they are like well-suited to be entrepreneurs. I mean, it's a, I feel like, you know, if you have very little human capital, very little cap money, and you are very close to a threshold where you're going to fall into starvation if something goes wrong, it seems insane to imagine that those are the right people to be the entrepreneurs. I mean, most con rich countries, fortunately, those guys uh, get a job. And uh, I don't, so I actually don't think that there is any surprise in that evidence. That's what one would have expected based on everything else we know about the poor. I, I just think that we, we wanted to, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a wonderful romance, right? To think that the, you know, the poor can uh, become entrepreneurs, create jobs for other poor people, people and just generally save the world and we don't even have to spend any money um, because we give them loans. Uh, that, that's a great fantasy. I don't see there's any, I don't think, on this particular point, I think I've probably studied the evidence for many, many years as much as anybody else. And I would say there's just no evidence that points in that direction. I think what much more evidence in Marx's direction, which is you, you, you get um, seeds into agriculture. There you, I suspect, uh, I think Dilip also has a nice paper on that. Seeds in agriculture get the poor richer. So if you want to get long-term growth, I think there are many things you can do other than giving money. I wasn't saying that money, giving money, giving money is pretty good. Uh, and it actually, what I was trying to say, which probably I didn't say clearly enough, is it actually generates long-term, the, the evidence we have is that it actually, for the very poor people, money actually pushes them to start things which then they can sustain. So I actually think that this generates sustained growth for them, not, um, I, but I, I wasn't saying that that's the only thing. I think Mark exactly rightly, and I, I've, uh, Dilip and Pranab Bardhan have this very nice paper as well. I think seeds are great. I mean, there are lots of things that are, that are good. I, I just don't think microcredit is one of those. I mean, I think it's, a, it's not bad, but it's just not one of the great wins that I've seen. Dilip, uh, yeah, uh, one, one thing to add. So I agree with everything that, that um, Abhijit said in, in, in that direction, but there's one one additional uh, point. And the point is that we need to distinguish between transfer programs and development programs. And if the issue is providing resources to poor people because we feel that poor people are entitled to a certain level of living, which most societies do, that's a different issue than a development uh, issue. And Abhijit is right in the sense that these attempts to give resources to the, to the poor in, in, in terms of microcredit are not doing the sustainable thing. And there are some instances where you can, because we know there are poverty traps. And sometimes those poverty traps can be overcome by having this initial seed money or, or whatever, whatever it is. But what this ignores is moral hazard. There are lots of examples in the history of time that when you give transfers that condition on a person being poor, that what you do is you're basically subsidizing poverty. And this has been a major concern. It's well recognized by every government in the world that if you have a program that conditions on just being poor, you're not going, you're going to have the opposite effect. And while you heard me diss the, the progressive program, which was this conditional cash transfer, if you take the perspective, not that it's a development program, and there I would take the stand that it clearly is not, but rather as a clever transfer program to the poor in the sense that it reduces moral hazard by creating an incentive not to pull children out of school or to spend the money on cigarettes and, and other sin uh, goods, as, as, they're, as they're called, but rather you, know, you maintain that at least some of this expenditure would go to schooling, it's a clever way to transfer money to the poor and overcome the moral hazard problem. So you can't scale up a program that's just going to simply give money to poor people because you have this long-term moral hazard problem. And so it's a basic dilemma. If it's really true that some amount of money can overcome the poverty trap so that you can get sustained um, improvements, as, as Abhijit is suggesting from some of these experiments, that's fine. But then if you actually announce this program, that if you're poor, you're going to get this seed money, it's going to have this other attribute. 
Mark, did you want to respond to the earlier? Oh yes, question? the discrimination. So this is a big, this is a big issue, and it's a, a, a current issue in, of course, in in India. That's in in debates. It reflects the the data, and I can go on and on for this. But let me let me say a few things of which that very quickly that last study actually points to some some issues. There was in fact an editorial in the Times of India on that study that I was presenting. And the basic view is, if you look at the occupational structure, and particularly the intergenerational changes in occupational structure, you see, in fact, that it is along caste lines and subcaste lines. If you look at particular occupations, they're dominated by upper caste. If you look at other occupations that are lower occupations, they're dominated by lower caste. And this persists not only across generations, but even within families. So if you're lower caste and you're in this occupation, your children are going to be, and that's what they expect. And if you look at this static view, one policy response is to say, the only way we're going to break this up is to have quotas and set-asides. We're going to say, we're going to force people to hire them in, the, in these good jobs. We're going to force people to set aside places in university positions for the low caste. It's a way of breaking up this, this discrimination. The alternative view is that this lack of mobility reflects something much more fundamental, which is lack of development. That the reason for this sort of static immobility is there is nothing going on structurally and fundamentally in the industrial economy of India that would break it up. The Mumbai example, and I wasn't stressing the caste part of it enough, obviously, and I wasn't making it as clear because I was going too fast, is an example where you see what looked like years and years of exactly the same. What I didn't show you was the table that showed exactly what I said. If you look at the grandparents and the parents in the same families, they were going into the same occupations in the same caste. When you looked at what was going on after the reforms, when you would fundamentally change the, the jobs in Mumbai with new jobs as a function of development, these caste line jobs were disappearing. And the intercaste marriage, which is the first indicator of the, the, the system breaking up, as I showed you, was rapidly declining. So you had a, this system that was in place for hundreds of years. Within 10 years of this reform, as indicated by the social mobility through marriage, was breaking up. As indicated by migration, there were more people from lower caste leaving Mumbai than ever before. There were more of them, of course, in the upper and elite, and elite schools than before. So the alternative view, and I'm not saying one is right and the other is wrong, it's a combination is that some of what you see and some of which has been attributed to discrimination is, in fact, a symptom of something which is lack of development. And that's, that's by the way, this, this latter, the lack of development issue, is what the Times of London took the stand on and said, look, we, we don't want a world in which we have set-asides and affirmative action along caste lines. We want a world of development, and that should take care of itself. The jury is open on this. The last thing I have to say on this, and it's a data issue, legislation in uh, India prevented the collection of information on subcast membership since 1931. So even though they had passed a law that basically said that we're going to provide set-asides based on subcast organization, they actually didn't have any data. So one of the debates that took place in the parliament was whether they should change that law to allow this information to be collected. And I believe they finally decided to collect it uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the governmental data. So in fact, since 1931, other than a few surveys, including some of the ones we've done, there was actually no data on what was going on with the, the unit that matters, which is the subcast unit. Not, the, these broad categories matter too, but people really belong, their networks are along the, the subcast lines. Mabajit's done some interesting work on, on marriage as well. Okay, there was a question in the back. Uh, thanks so much. That was a, uh, a, a great panel. I have a, a question for Professors Banerjee and perhaps uh, Dilip Mukherjee as well, and then a related comment on, on Mark, uh, Mark Rosen's work. My, I, I, uh, I really think that uh, RCTs and that, that whole approach is an incredible innovation. Dilip and I team taught a class last semester, and we sent students out to, um, uh, to rural India to look at RC, to do an RCT in, in, uh, in pot with potato farmers. Um, but my, my question, uh, I, I was struck by something that Dilip said last semester. I think you were chairing the bre a bread conference, and almost all of the uh, submissions by young development economists were in RCTs or micro development. And uh, my con question is, uh, I have absolutely nothing against what you're doing, but what if the entire field becomes you? 
I want to read a, 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 a quote from Prana Bartam in the new issue of, uh, of, of the Boston Review, which I, I think is, uh, is really interesting. Uh, Bartam says, as the experimental program becomes its own kind of fad, other issues in development are being ignored. Um, uh, researchers often lose interest in important questions that cannot feasibly be explored using randomization methods. Some of these questions are historical, institutional, and structural in nature and have very little to do with the impact of simple treatments such as those of microhealth and educational intervention. For instance, governments often have to make decisions about the proper industrial policy to pursue in light of potential market and government failures, how much to invest in physical infrastructure, where to locate a power plant or build a shipyard, uh, small-scale experimental methods do not offer uh, much guidance here. Again, I, I am not criticizing what you're doing at all. I think it's incredible, but I think the, the economists on the first panel were dealing with uh, the problem of all macroeconomists who think about development being into rational expectations or new Keynesianism with ISLM built into a DSGE model, which all, you know, the whole profession became one of those two things and is completely in, a, in crisis now uh, because it didn't have uh, so much plural plurality. So uh, I, I wonder what your thoughts about, uh, about uh, the other parts of the prof development economics profession besides yourself. And re related to that, a, a comment on, uh, on the Rosenzweig presentation, which was, which was, uh, which was fascinating. And I, I think you hit it on the nail there when you talk about we've got to distinguish between transfer programs and sort of poverty alleviation programs uh, and, and development. With all due respect to uh, uh, President Zedillo, he's never been too close to the peer-reviewed literature on this stuff. Um, uh, and the literature on, on CCTs is a, is a little bit more mixed than the way he uh, did it, uh, in part, I have to plug here, uh, uh, thanks to Santiago Levy, a former a member of the BU Economics Department, who in the first democratic government after Zedillo was in charge of the Opportunidades program that, that improved upon Progressa. And if you look at that, if you look at the econometrics li literature there, it's a little bit more mixed. There's some uh, better improvements in education and some health improvements, but Levy himself uh, is, uh, is now uh, very much against the program, or not against the program, but critical of it for some of the reasons that, that you note. Uh, one is the moral hazard, and two, because uh, he says that what the program has done is created highly educated, uh, uh, highly educated dishwashers in the United States. Um, and that Mexico has had a failed trade policy, a failed agricultural policy, and a, uh, a lack of innovation policy, and not looking at these broader things in development. So if we're all going down this road, I'm a little concerned. I think the, the, the first panel shows that we, we've got to have some sort of plural, plurality in, in how we think about economics uh, in, in the profession. Thanks. Over you. Um, I guess, uh, I think, uh, I'm one of the few people, uh, I think, in the development profession who teach a course called Development Macro Issues. Uh, so I, I have no fundamental disagreement with the claim that we don't, we can't uh, simply know the effect of, uh, you know, giving, um, I know, iron to people and seeing what happens to their um, productivity. I, I'm, I'm sure we, we would need to, we need to do many more things. And I, I think what, what doesn't follow from that claim is that we, the best way to learn about these macro issues is to uh, A, run cross-country regressions, or B, um, essentially, um, you know, talk about, um, vaguely about you know grand miracles uh, that that happened because of some big policy change or the other i mean this i, I think I, I think the there is a there's a tricky st step there which is um i think you raised exactly the right question which is you know what what should we say about industrial policy well the first thing we should say about industrial po well, there are two things to be said about industrial policy one asim may come come back to on you know do we actually trust governments to do industrial policy effectively? But let, let, let me park that for a minute. Um, it's, uh, I, I think the key issue is what, what, what mechanism do we have for identifying the market and government failures that uh, Pranab Bhardhan is so worried about? And to be honest, uh, running a cross-country regression of countries which had overvalued exchange rates, uh, GDP on overvalued exchange rate doesn't persuade me very much, and I, I hope it doesn't persuade policymakers either. Um, 
So I think in the end, we need to estimate good structural parameters that we can use to figure out what are the interventions we need to do. I, I'm in favor of intervention. I mean, in fact, I might be the most interventionist person on this table in more, on most respects. So I, I'm in favor of interventions, but I, I don't see. A, but I do think that there is a, that the economics uh, literature has done a lousy job of identifying interventions, and they've done a lousy job because of I think pursuing the view that macro questions need macro regressions to answer. I think we're much better off estimating structural parameters, doing careful micro work and then aggregating them to figure out where the market failures are uh, and then intervening there then using uh, evidence that comes from from I think bad regression so I, I mean I'm, I'm entirely in favor of doing macro policy but I just think macro policy should not be left to macroeconomics <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mean since you partially addressed the question to me uh, also I mean uh, I think Mark's talk amply illustrates that RCTs is not all that economists do, and that a lot can be learned by very serious attempts to gather large data sets and study them at the micro level to understand how large questions such as trade policy uh, or uh, you know, agricultural policy and so on can work. So to understand how macro policies work throughout the economy, Ultimately, I mean, the limitations of cross-country regressions are, I think, well known now. And so I, I think it's extremely important to, to test, you know, theories about how these macro policies work throughout the, the economy. And clearly, uh, RCTs can only go part of the way. But let me just turn to Mark and uh, if he wants to, to address this as well. Before you go on to the non-economists in the room, what are RCTs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Our yeah, cities yeah. okay. okay. uh, uh, these are randomized control trials, okay. yeah, just akin to uh, uh, medicine and public health and so on. Yeah. So you've heard CCRs, which is cross-country regressions, and RCTs, which are randomized control trials. You've also heard... Um, CCTs, just, yes. just to combine Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I meant the, the RCT is... Uh, sorry, there's, this, there's also the conditional cash transfer. There's what is next, right? Which is... All right, so there's a lot of confusion. All right, so randomized control trial is um, a tool. Regression is a tool. Structural, structural estimation is a tool, right? And they all have their place in the economy. Randomized control trials is a new tool in development. There's a lot of excitement uh, over them. If we can, my beef with it is not the methodology. It's great, and it's actually added a lot of knowledge in, in many cases, is just like regression analysis, RCT, some, a lot of RCTs, randomized controlled trial work, is trivial and not important and not speaking to major issues. Just like a lot of other methods that are used, like regressions, are trivial, and even structural models, right, are, are trivial. That is to say, learning about whether um, changing interest rates affects the repayment rates and loans in a particular uh, NGO providing loans in particular setting is somewhat informative. Okay? The RCTs, to the extent that they address fundamental questions that will help us understand some of the major issues in development, can be a really valuable tool in conjunction with other things as well. So it's, if we think of it as just a tool, and there's been a lot of excitement about the tool, and it solves a lot of the problems that we used to have of arguing about instruments and identification, right? But uh, we're also learning its limitations, just like with all new tools. And if you actually look at the, the people that um, get good jobs as young PhDs uh, who are in development, it's uh, less than half are actually doing RCT. So it's not true, it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say that the whole profession of young people is, is doing RCTs. There's a lot more to it than that. Uh, so we're, they're a good tool, but like other tools, uh, they can produce good work and they can produce trivial work. And maybe for the most part, most studies are trivial, right? There's very few of any type of study that really is um, going to revolutionize the way we think. We saw an example, a wonderful example today of one of those studies that, that had that effect of changing the way we think about a problem that has persisted for however many years, right? Uh, it wasn't an RCT. Asim, would you like to no, no. comment? Okay, so I think. Can I then ask Asim a question? 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I get away with it. <laughs> yeah, right. We need them there. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but I did. I, I find all, th all three extremely fascinating, as I knew I would. Uh, if I heard Asim's or understood Asim's frustrations right, uh, he's kind of saying that uh, politics matters. Right? And for those of us here who, who study uh, politics, that's a disturbing statement because we thought, you know, you guys had the answers. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if Robert Wade is still here, course. but in the spirit of you know, his saying in the morning about not being starry-eyed, starry-eyed as I am, I would call a conference development that work. I would never call a conference politics that works. Uh, and so, so the sort of part of the question there is that you seem to be saying good economics will not work if you have bad politics. That even if you identify the right intervention, if you don't have those institutions or actors right, and, and I'm, if that's what I'm understanding, mm -hmm. it won't work. Uh, and so I'm wondering if the flip would work, that if you actually got good politics somehow, uh, then would a lot of these interventions that are showing suboptimal results, will they start showing better results? Uh, that are you actually passing the buck to us and saying, you guys fix the politics first? Uh, so, so first of all, I, I don't think it's just politics. Um, I do think it's a policy actor. And for me, that actor is a, very, is a much broader beast than just politics in the way. Uh, in terms of um, are we passing on the buck to sort of saying this, I, so, uh, I don't think so in that sense. I don't think one is a necessary sufficient condition to get the other. Um, uh, all I was pointing out to is that in development, at least in e development economics, we've made a lot of progress, if you will, in mapping out kind of the technical production function of a problem. We're making tremendous progress in figuring out if I add this input to, if I add an extra teacher or an extra textbook, or if I add better seeds, um, what are the possibilities of that action? Um, I am saying, though, that that by itself doesn't seem to be sufficient always. Um, that presupposes an actor who then takes that knowledge, takes that newly found production function, and says, aha, this is what I was missing. All I need to do is apply this. Sometimes it works. Sometimes we have the happy coincidence, or maybe not, where that actor takes that on. My worry is that I don't want to leave that to chance anymore. Um, I want to make sure I understand what that actor's incentives were. And the reason I want to do that is, ultimately, I'm even greedier. I want to be able to define a bigger production function which has the technical aspects, how education really works. Do we need textbooks? Do we need teachers? Do we need other sort of better ways of learning, pedagogical sort of uh, reform, better seeds, or so on and so forth? But I also want to include in that production function the teachers, the monitors, the politicians, every one of their sort of, if you will, relative elasticities. In exactly the same way I measure an elasticity of you know, what is the learning response to having a better teacher, I want to be able to figure out what is, a le what is the learning gain of having a more informed politician or a differentially incentivized politician or, or a bureaucrat. The tools, in fact, so for me, it's very much within the same toolkit that, that Mark and, and Abhijit alluded to. I feel that toolkit has a lot to add. Um, I also want to be very cognizant of, of not being naive about, I think um, other literatures like political science has made tremendous progress in terms of understanding um, these actors. Uh, half of my colleagues have made tremendous progress. What I feel like we can bring in is the same set of structural tools we've used to estimate elasticities in, in, in things as, as mundane as a new seed variety to, to this field. I don't think it'll quite answer it, but I feel like there's a lot of room for progress there from, from our side. Uh, and that's, I think that's the... Uh, this is grand mechanism design, if you will, uh, take that I have. And, and if it you might end up with very different policy implications. It might turn out that what seemed like very effective in that narrow view of the production function, which is getting teachers to be present more, when you realize that there's a, there's a counter response uh, so, uh, from the policy actor, from the rents, the person whose rents you took away, away is now responding, there might be a slightly different intervention you'll come up with, which co-opts him or has some sort of cozy and bargain in some sense with him. So to come back, it's politically very hard to come back. Let's look at that broker example I gave you. How do I get these, these brokers? One way is to just destroy the brokers, to have such a power that you basically completely subvert these powerful brokers. That does, I don't see that happening anytime soon in the economy I was thinking about. The other way is to, to, to have the brokers be willing to move to a different equilibrium where they make just as much money, in fact, far more money through brokerage commissions. 
How would you get that equilibrium? That's a much harder question. I don't have an answer to that. But that's, a, that's what I'm saying. It leads to a very different policy prescription as well from shove reforms down the SEC, we'll solve every problem. That's not happened for the last five years. I can't imagine it'll happen for the next 15. The alternative is figure out how to get them on board in a way which isn't destructive or rent-seeking. And that's OK, is uh, anybody else have a burning question? Yeah, it's, it's just kind of following up on what Dr. Asim was just talking about. I think it's really important that he brought up the comment about the policy actors because in my opinion, um, a lot of these development um, policies that are being carried out, especially in Africa, because that's where I'm from, in West Africa, we know the challenge um, with state failure and political institutions that aren't working um so i guess i just want to clarify is if i, I just want to cl clarify if what um he's talking about is more of a thinking about a theoretical model that sort of um integrates the the political context in which the development policies are being carried out i just want to and so i guess my question is 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 that what he's talking about when he's um, talking about so the considering the policy actors? So let me, I think that's let me be very brief there. I actually think we've made decent, there's quite a few models out there. Um, my worry is that both models of how politicians work or how bureaucrats work, or how decision maker works are empirically very uninformed. At, at this micro level, at the level that Abhijit and Mark were referring to, we just simply don't have the data on this. So a lot of our ideas behind these models are lacking far more empirics than they are theory. So I actually feel that the revolution that is waiting to happen or the bigger push is more on the empirical side. And then we can go back to the theory side. There's a, there's a calibration which needs to happen. Our calibration is anecdotal right now. And there's some really nice books, but they're all my, my travels through the bureaucracy of X country. And that just doesn't cut it. OK, uh, with that, uh, we draw this panel to a close. And uh, Adil is going to uh, make some closing remarks. So first of all, thanks to, uh, thanks to, <laughs> thanks, thanks to, to a great conversation to, to, and, and a fitting, fitting into what I think has been a fruitful and, and thought-provoking day.